I will be reading from the Gospel according to St. John. But we've, before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we give thanks this day, the day that you have made, and that uh, we ask that we could uh, honor you in everything you have done for us, the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, that we may recognize you in everything we do. Father, we know that uh, everything in the world that you have commanded, we should uh, honor you. We know that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life does not come from you, but it is from the world. And Lord, although those that are proud and the pride that you oppose them, humble them, Lord, and humble us that we may see you in everything. In Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. I would ask the congregation to please rise for a reading of God's word. John chapter 6, starting in verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit. And they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time... Many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. He that has ears, let him hear. You may be seated. Thank you, Brother Joe. Well, we're going to look at God's Word today. Um, oh yeah, I'm supposed to sit on my stool. Um, those of you that aren't aware, it's because of my hernia, and so it just is easier than standing for the next, you know, 10 minutes. <laughs> As a joke, yeah, that's true. Um, but today, what we are going to look at, we, you know, you, I understand you guys never quite know, is, is Pastor Bruce going to cover 10 verses, 4 verses, 16 verses? So we're, we're obviously going to go through a lot of verses today, but we're only going to go through these two that are on the screen out of what was just read. And the reason why is because next week, 
Uh, by the way, next week, just in case anybody needs the reminder, is Father's Day. Okay? So just, just in case anybody needs that reminder. Um, but next week, we're going to talk about the challenge of hard words, hard teaching. Um, and, and there's a lot of verses surrounding what we just read to do with that. Today we're talking about how it is the Spirit that gives life. And in doing so, there's a contrast here. And so when we're looking at, at this particular set of verses, the contrast is the spirit and the flesh. Now, we referenced this verse 63 last week. In helping us understand when Jesus was talking about these other things, he's talking about uh, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, and everybody gets all in an uproar because they, they hear cannibalism and they hear all sorts of strange things. These words I have spoken to you are spirit and life as opposed to the flesh. He's not talking about fleshly things here. He's talking about spiritual things. Spiritual things. So, we need to drill down on this topic of the difference between it is the Spirit who gives life and Jesus' teaching that gives spirit and life as opposed to the flesh. So, we're going to start at what I would consider to be the beginning. The beginning is those who do not have the Spirit. If you are not in Christ, you do not have the Spirit. This is how the Scriptures describe that. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. So without Christ, this is our status, dead, without life. See, we often think dead, and we, again, think physically the physical is a picture of the spiritual. Uh, the physical is actually a short period of time that we're existing right now, but it paints a picture of the bigger eternity question. So you were dead, not in your body, though that does happen. You were dead spiritually. You're dead spiritually without Christ. And here's the beauty of the gospel, right? God made alive together with Him having forgiven us all our trespasses. God. And, and we talked about that a few weeks ago, that yes, we are called to believe, right? We're not ever going to stop saying that. You and I, we all need to believe the gospel, believe in Jesus, believe what He has done. But the deep truth to remind ourselves of gives us great assurance. God did that work in us. God does the work of saving us. We don't actually do it, but we are to believe. He does it, and He forgives us, and it's all based on Christ. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we would say. So again, in Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to read a few verses this time, um, starting at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead... Okay, once again, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is not work in the sons of disobedience. We're going to continue reading, but make note here. The sins are not only sort of that personal action you make, right? We get that. We all understand we do things and it's sin. We get, we get that. The flesh likes that. The flesh wants, as I said a few weeks ago, the, the Twinkies instead of the good food, right? The, the flesh wants to do the unhealthy. The flesh wants to do the sin. We get that. But it's actually bigger than the individual. This is a global, full of history reality. And it is the fact that humanity and this world, on their own without God, follow the opposite direction of God, follow the evil one, the prince of the power of the air. Okay? So, so it's a good reminder for us, we're not only talking about my personal poor decision of sin. It's way bigger than that. This is a global 
long time history reality. So, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. So, we were all once part of that. That's what he's saying. So, so there's none of us exempt. There's nobody here saying, no, I don't have that past. I, I, I was never a sinner. If Jesus is here, please let us, let us know. No, he's not here. That's right. He is here spiritually, but he's not here as standing and walking. He's not returned today. Um, he's the only one that can actually say that. He's the only one. The rest of us, we all have common history. Common history. And sometimes we forget it. The longer sometimes we've been saved and going to church, we forget sometimes that history. We get so far removed from it. And then what happens is we lose our empathy for the lost. We lose our empathy for new believers that are struggling. And we need to be reminded, like the Apostle Paul does here for the Ephesians, hey, we all were those people lost and dead in our sins, given over to the passions of our flesh, carrying out desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Enemies of God is what he's meaning there. But God, I love it. Love it when a sentence starts like that. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Mm, I could camp there. I could live in that verse. But God, because of his great love, that should overwhelm every single one of us. That love that He loves us with, way beyond what we understand, believe me, even when we were still dead in those trespasses, He made us alive, gave us life. This, is, this isn't just a, uh, a baby was born, right? The making of life in a womb, which is miraculous and wonderful. Don't get me wrong. This is resurrecting the spiritually dead this is the one who should have had life in them and doesn't. And God gives it because of Christ, made alive together with Christ. We talked about being in Christ. When you are saved, you're in Christ. That means the life He's been given, we also are recipients of. Together with Christ by grace. It's an amazing gift of God. We didn't earn it. We didn't achieve it. We didn't live up to it. We didn't somehow make God happy enough. doesn't work that way. It is a gift of God in spite of our dead, sinful, self-centeredness that we have in our humanity. And then He ignites life in us. And that's drastically different. Opposite of the death. Do you, you catch this? Opposites, death and life, sinfulness, righteousness, lost, saved. i sorry, I should mix this up or people will think I'm talking about sides of the room. Saved, <laughs> lost. Anyways, you get what I'm saying. Opposites. These aren't uh, minute shifts. These are drastic differences. It's not even close to one another. Consider this before we even talk about the next verse. When God saved you, you were an active participation, participant in the military for the enemy. And he not only took you and you're laying dead in the battlefield because you're actually useless, but you're on the wrong side. And he not only gives you life, he brings you into his home and calls you his child. It makes no sense to our humanity. We wouldn't do it. We wouldn't do it. We would say, leave them dead on the battlefield. They're our enemy. That's what humanity says. But God is so much better. This is what he does. Raises us up with Christ and seats us with him in his home, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, now we talk about the future, the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Eternal hope, the fullness of our salvation. And when we use the word hope, we've said it here before for those of you who have been around, 
We're not talking about human hope. Human hope, we use that word with the possibility that it could happen, right? I, I hope to be there. Uh, I hope to win the lottery. That's what people use it as. They say, I hope. When it's in the Bible, it is a certainty that we have not yet received fully. That's what the hope is. So it is not the way we use it in our common modern human language. It is in a fullness of certainty, yet not fully received. We hope and know eternity, but we're not there yet. And it's part of the comfort we receive. We have loved ones that have gone on before us in that hope. And they are experiencing far more of that hope than us. And we praise God for that. That is His goodness. That is His mercy and grace poured out in Christ. And they are recipients of that if they know Jesus. And we celebrate it, even in sorrow. Then let's move on to Titus, chapter 3. Great passage. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So now, moving forward, so we talked about, first, without the Spirit, without salvation, we're dead in sin. We're saved, grace of God in Christ, washing of regeneration, renewal by the Holy Spirit. It's a Trinitarian reality of salvation. The Father is the one who loves, ordains, plans, puts it into motion. Jesus, the one who actively fulfills the requirements and on whom we trust and is our Lord, the one we follow. And the Holy Spirit ignites in us, washes us clean, gives us life, fills us, indwells us, renews us. The Spirit gives life. So it's a salvation thing. Why did Jesus' hearers in John chapter 6 not understand? They weren't in the Spirit. Why can we understand what He's saying? The Spirit. Not, not because we're Bible scholars. There are many Bible scholars in many universities in this world that study this book massively and are very lost in sin. The Bible is a wonderful, wonderful book. We do not take it lightly. We take it very seriously. It is foundational to our faith. But the only reason you and I can gain understanding from it is because of the Holy Spirit's work in us. That's why. That's why. The light comes on. The Spirit prompts you. You read a passage and then the Spirit convicts you. That's the way it works. It's, it's not all Bible, no Spirit. It's not all Spirit, no Bible. Nope. Both. Both. They're meant to go together. And so this regeneration, this giving of life, taking you from dead to living and renewal is in the Holy Spirit. Not because of us, not because of our righteousness, because of God. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now the Lord is Spirit. So remember... All that we keep going through in John, we keep seeing this stuff pointing to the Trinity. And again, throughout the rest of the Bible, we see it. So in 2 Corinthians, we get this great reminder. Now the Lord is Spirit, right? One of the members of the Trinity. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So this is not talking about uh, some uh, unseen outpouring of power. Okay, that's a false teaching. If you're, if you're listening to somebody and that's their take on the Holy Spirit, that's false teaching. Now, is there power outpoured in the Holy Spirit? Yes. But it's because of the person of the Spirit of God that is the Holy Spirit. It's not just an impersonal force that the, you know, the Father says, well, go and do and this and that, and it happens. Impersonal? No, no. Personal. Three-person Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. The Lord is Spirit. This is a person who does this. Where the Spirit, the person of the Lord is, there is freedom. 
And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord and being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. This is work of the Spirit in a life. And the, the comparison here, when it talks about beholding the glory of the Lord, and we're not going to turn there today, but if you read in the Old Testament, and you're reading about the people of Israel, and, and Moses has led them out of Egypt, out of slavery and captivity, and they're wandering around the wilderness. Moses would go and meet with the Lord, and he'd come out, and the people were in fear because his face is glowing. So Moses would put a veil on for the sake of the people, for the sake of the people. So in the same way, that's what's being talked about here, but it says, and we all with unveiled face, we no longer worry about the veil. We don't worry about there needing to be some kind of a barrier between the glory of God and us. This also points to the temple. There was a special veil between what they called the Holy of Holies, the holiest place where the presence of God was, and the rest of even the priests. It was once a year, the high priest could go in there. They, they had bells on his outfit. Uh, in case the Lord struck him down, they could hear that there was no more movement. And they'd have a rope on his leg so they could pull him out because they didn't dare to go in after him. We don't have that worry. If you're in Christ, no veil required. You get to commune directly with the living God and behold His glory. And one day in eternity, we will in fullness do that, and it will be wonderful. And it is a ministry that begins right now in us by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of God. Now, Romans chapter 8. There's some hard things about this because it's true. Live life by the Spirit. New life, not old life. We, opportunity for righteousness in Christ. Real righteousness, not our human righteous concepts. Opposite, not dead, now living. But there's problems. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's important. Do you know why it's important, though? It's important because even those who are now in Christ Jesus still sin. We, we still struggle. We aren't perfect here in this flesh. We wrestle with these things. So we are grateful. This is a statement we are thankful for. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Give thanks. He is good. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Again, contrast, right? In the Spirit, you are set free. But you're set free by a law in the Spirit. You're not set free to do whatever you want. You're set free to live the new life you've been given in Christ. You're set free to live that new life the Spirit of God has begun in you and that He will carry to completion. You are set free to be one who lives as a disciple of Jesus, one surrendered to Him. That's your freedom. It's not freedom to sin. It's not freedom to do the old stuff. That's not the permission we get in free. It's free to something you cannot do without Christ. It's new. It's better. It's good. It's how we live out our faith to honor the one who has saved us the law of the Spirit of life, as opposed to the law of sin and death. And that's the law of condemnation. That's the law of bondage. It's the law of so many dark things, and we see it around us every day. Then we move forward in Romans chapter 8 to chapters 14 and 15, and there's a bunch of good stuff in between, but for time today, we aren't going to go there. We get this great reminder for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Again, don't, get head up, don't ever get hung up on the fact that we get these passages and it describes all of you who are in Christ as sons. There's important reason for that. It's why we don't change it. 
We don't like gender neutral it or something like that. That would be really inappropriate. And really inappropriate partly because of the significance. Back in the Bible times, generally speaking, there's the odd exception, but for the most part, not only in Israel, throughout most of those early world cultures, the sons were those who inherit. That's just the reality of the context that we're reading. In Christ, all, guys, ladies, all of us are sons, meaning inheritors, meaning part of this eternal inheritance with Christ. Same playing field. That's why we don't change it or we miss the significance of it, okay? So we, we don't do things because culture doesn't like them or likes them. That's not why we do them. The Bible is the Bible. We change for it, okay? So we hold it and then we change. So all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Key thing there, led by the Spirit, If you are not led by the Spirit, you're not one of the sons of God. Yeah, but I've been going to church my whole life, Pastor Bruce. I'm obviously one of the sons of God. Nope. Going to church doesn't make you son of God. Signing a document that says you're a member doesn't do it. Are you in Christ? Therefore, the Spirit of God is in you and the one who leads your life. You surrendered to Him. Okay, you're one of these sons of God then. That's what that's saying. So, that's true? Great. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Apostle Paul's reminding us, you didn't get a different spirit. You didn't get a spirit of fear and slavery. You received a spirit that brings you into the family of God. And I like the fact that it adds the word Abba with Father. The the Father word is, is more formal, and the Abba word is more informal. So it's kind of like saying Daddy Father or Papa Father, right? So there's there's the healthy respect, but also the closeness. That you and I are like the toddler that can run to the Lord and climb up on His lap. That's how our relationship with God is in Christ, by the Holy Spirit. That's who He is to us. You're adopted into His family. So then we get this reminder in 2 Timothy again. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So, God gave us a spirit not of fear again. Boy, this thing comes up a couple of times about not having fear. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. I want you to remember that it's there, okay? That's not part of your salvation. And so often fear controls us, but it's not meant to be part of our salvation. Self-control, yep, that's meant to be part of our salvation. Love, oh yeah. I mean, you just have to read our sign outside. Do you love God? Do you love others? Okay. If you're doing both those things, then have some fun doing it. You notice I say have some fun doing it. We're not talking about the kind of fun that takes you away from loving God. We're not talking about the kind of fun that says, well, okay, I loved God yesterday and today I'm going to be nasty to people. No. If it doesn't fit the first two statements, it's not my concept of fun. It might be the flesh's concept of fun. I mean, that's what we're talking about today, this contrast. Love God, love others. In the Spirit, not in the flesh, not in the flesh. The flesh is weak and empty. For those who live according to the flesh, in Romans 8, now we're back to some of the middle verses, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Right there, we could stop, but for, to set the mind on the flesh is death. It, it even brings it home more, doesn't it? But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace and peace. Here's the thing. We all struggle with this. Our minds, often driven 
by the stuff of this world, by the stuff of our own physical selves, and we are distracted. We are distracted continually. But that's not what we're supposed to be like. So we go to Galatians briefly. 5.22 to 25, and it's familiar for many of you. It says this, but the fruit of the Spirit, fruit, singular, singular, right? So the, it's not multiple fruits. It's singular fruit, as in there is one Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, and this is what He produces. This is what He produces in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. That is how we are to live. That's what that's saying. You want to live by the Spirit? That's what it looks like. And it doesn't look like because you figured it out. It looks like because less of me, more of the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit that leads and does, not me. It's the Spirit. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So in other words, what's my part? Suppress the flesh. Not create what the Spirit's supposed to create. No. Suppress my own self. Or these wonderful words, crucify it. Well, that's harsh. Yep along with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. The Spirit leads, the Spirit directs, the Spirit guides. So let me sum it up with this stuff. The flesh is sin-filled. In other words, human and worldly thinking, emotions, action, human and worldly is sinful. And it seeps in. It creeps into the church. It has for generations. It's not a new thing. It's an old thing. It's why a lot of the New Testament's written. It's written to defend the church against the fleshly, human, worldly thinking coming into the church and undermining our faith. So you need to be aware. You need to be aware first and foremost for yourself. It creeps in. And we all know it. We all know it because we all struggle. So in contrast... The Spirit is life-filled, God-inspired thinking, God-honoring emotions, God-directed action, right? Not human and worldly, God. God. That's the Christian life. God, righteousness, righteous life, holiness, driven by His Word. You want to know what that looks like? It's here. But I can tell you there's a, a struggle that we have. If you've surrendered to Jesus, the Spirit resides in you, and you have life and the ability to live honoring Him in the Spirit. You have that ability. You know, we talked about free will a while back. You want to experience true free will? The closest thing to it is only going to happen if you're in Christ. Because you don't have the ability to choose righteousness without it. If the Spirit of God is not living in you, you cannot choose righteousness. You cannot choose God-honoring. It doesn't work. But we have this struggle because if you're in Christ, you have now this ability. You can live to honor Him in the Spirit. You can follow His Word and live in obedience. It's wonderful. Though we're in the Spirit, we're still in our flesh too, though and this world. And as such, we struggle. We struggle with our old dead flesh, and we often fall to its ways, thinking, emotions, and acts. That's our struggle. It's real. And, and it's each of us. One of the biggest disservices we do with our brothers and sisters is not letting them know that this is common for all of us. The number of conversations I have with people, not just recently here, but over the years of ministry, of somebody feeling like nobody else will understand. Nobody else gets this. I'm the one who's the odd person out. The rest of them have it together. I'm the one with the struggles. No. It's all of us. It's all of us. Myself creeps in. My fears, desires, 
emotions, behaviors. So, oh, don't get me wrong. <laughs> There's the obvious, right? The obvious struggle? Oh, well, my flesh wants to go out drinking and partying. And the Spirit's saying, no, don't do it, so I don't do it. Okay? It's a struggle. Flesh, spirit, that's, that's real. We get it. The, the, the flesh, you know, wants to go and murder somebody, and the Spirit says, no, you're not supposed to do that. We, we understand struggle, spirit, flesh, big sins, big horrific things, right? Remember how it kept saying fear in there? Do we realize that when we are governed by fear, that's the flesh? When we make decisions based on our fears, that's the flesh. That is not the Spirit of God. You were not saved to be fearful. The problem we have is our flesh. The flesh wants us to be fearful. The world wants us to be fearful. We don't serve the world. We serve the Creator of the world. We don't serve our flesh. We serve the King of kings and Lord of lords who paid our price for our sin. We serve Jesus and He comes back in victory, vanquishes all of God's enemies. And we serve Him. And we trust Him, whether our lives are required of us or not. That is who we are saved to be. Not people of fear. Not people who the weights of this world control. Now, don't get me wrong. Is it hard? Yes. Yes. It's hard. Do I get distracted over people in my family that are lost? Yes. Should I be distracted positively so that I pray for them, so that I share the gospel with them? Yes. But often I'm distracted negatively where I begin to worry and have fear and I don't act. That's the flesh. That's not the spirit. We've got to take seriously the difference between the flesh and the spirit. When I want things my way, flesh. When I feel life isn't working out the way I want it to, flesh. When I can find contentment resting in the Lord regardless of what life throws at me, that's the spirit. When I can worship and celebrate God and His glory and have much joy, even though life was hard this week and there's sickness and there's people losing their jobs and there's people losing their places to live and all sorts of horrific things going on around me, that's still the Spirit. Worship the Lord with joy, thanksgiving, and peace. We have people this morning worshiping the Lord and this has been a reprieve from the rest of the week because the rest of the week has been horrifically hard. Horrifically hard. But the Lord is good. And when we surrender ourselves, we surrender when we come to Christ. We surrender ourselves to the Lord, you know, follow Him, right? That's what we do. But we go on surrendering. When you recognize the flesh has been winning, you surrender your life to the Spirit. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, we confess. That's, that's where it starts. You confess that it's sin. I've, I've been led by my fears. I've been led by my human thinking and wisdom. I've been led by, and you could name your things, whatever they are. I've been led by my addictions. I've been led by my money. I've been led by my idolatries of all sorts, whatever they are. And you confess it to God. Now, this is to the Christian. Now, if you're here and you're not saved yet, guess what? You can pretty close to follow the same concept here. It's pretty similar. We'd give you a couple of variations about recognizing that you are saved through Jesus Christ and Him alone, that He forgives all of your sin because of His work on the cross, that He is God the Son who came in the flesh, born of a virgin, died 
in your place on the cross, rose again in victory, sits at the right hand of the Father. We would teach you some things on that to make sure you understand what you're doing. But for those who are in Christ, confess your sin. And responding to your flesh is sin. Yeah, but you don't know how hard it's been, Pastor. No, I do. Because we're all in the same boat. The specifics are different for each of us, but the situation is the same. So we confess. And then in your prayer, thank Him. Turn your sin state into thanksgiving. Thank Him because He's already forgiven you in Christ. You're not needing fresh forgiveness. You're not needing to go back to the cross. If you are saved, if you are in Christ, thank Him because you've received that forgiveness already in Christ. You just haven't been living in it. And we don't want to stay that way. It's not who you're called to be. You're saved to life. Life in the Spirit. So then what do we do? We take steps. Right? Turn away from the fleshly sinful ways and strive to live and surrender to the Spirit and His Word. That's what we do. We confess it in prayer. We give thanks because we know we're forgiven. And then we actually take opposite direction steps. So, if you've been governed by fear, right? Maybe your bank balance isn't so high. You're making decisions based on that. You know what? That's, I, I get we make decisions based on that in that, like, hey, yeah, I don't have money to go down and have a big fancy dinner at the restaurant this week. Uh, we're not talking about that. We're talking about life-governing decisions, not the specifics of how you work your household budget, though that's important. Are you governing your life in the fear of your finances, for instance? I happen to know a guy that I coach on this often because he found himself in a healthy financial situation and he had lived in that for a while. And then things changed and they they got a little tight. And he phoned me once. He was distraught because his bank balance had dropped below 10,000 in his checking account. Uh, At the time, I was on mission in Ireland and would have loved to have had that problem. Um, but his struggle wasn't actually the finances. It was the flesh. The flesh felt comfort in the good financial picture he had been in. And he saw it going the wrong way. The flesh was crying out because of it. So we recognize the sin, confessing it, We then give thanks for forgiving that we receive in Christ. Then, you actually have to take steps. You have to take steps in the other direction. And it's the same with anything in your life. If you're here today and your flesh struggle is lustfulness, and you say, well, what do you mean by lustfulness? I mean lustfulness. Oh, and by the way, it shows up differently. Don't, don't get me wrong. We could pick on symptoms, but the core is lustfulness. We could talk about pornography, and we could talk about uh, rom-com, romance movies, and all sorts of things that lustfulness tends to promote. But the core is lustfulness. And if that's the struggle in your flesh, after you confess it and give thanks for forgiveness, take steps in the opposite direction. Well, what do you mean? You mean just stay away from it? Well, that's part of it. Are you married? Pour your life into your spouse. Are you single? Pour your life into the Lord for sure. And some Christian friends would be helpful. People to surround yourself with that supports you positively on these things. Accountability. Take steps. If it's the financial fears, take steps. What are those steps? Well, if the fear is you're holding on to your money, maybe you need to look at how you give. Maybe you need to look at what you're doing with the money you've been given. And maybe you need to look at other things in your life that you're afraid of losing if the finances aren't right. Maybe there's other idols in your life 
that are tied to this. I mean, I was in Fort Mac for a while, right? A number of years. And there was heartbreaking scenarios up there because you had people that were earning more money than they'd ever earned anywhere else. And then they lived like it. And when you meet a young guy and he's got a house and he's got three vehicles in the driveway that are all his and financed and a boat and a quad and a this and a that and everything's financed. And he's going along, it's great. Yeah, and then all of a sudden they said, no more overtime, we're, we're cutting things here. And life's crumbling in his mind. Why? Because the fleshly reliance on that was tied to all these idols. And you're faced with your idols then. So you got to deal with those things, whatever they are. Those are just examples. If you're afraid in your life, look at the reasons why and see if it's something you need to repent of. And then we learn to trust God more. Um, and I'm going to leave it with that for now. I, I, I just really think we need to take some time today and respond in prayer. So I'm going to pray. Um, a lot of you are burdened with things and you're struggling. And don't get me wrong, I don't want anyone to think I've just made light of your fears. Your fears are as serious as everybody else's. But know this, the Lord didn't save you to live in that. And it doesn't mean the circumstance surrounding how you feel aren't real. It's real. You're fighting cancer, it's real. You're losing your house, it's real. You lost your job last week, it's real. Your family member passed away recently, it's real. There's real things going on. But that doesn't mean we want you to stay bound in that, in fear, in the negative emotions and the worldly thinking, the bondage of the flesh. We want you to understand that in the Spirit of God, you have the ability to find love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Not only in how you live with others, but in how you live with yourself. It's both. It's both. So if you need prayer today, um, the elders are going to keep their eyes open. If anybody wants prayer, they can either come up or they can raise a hand and uh, an elder will go to you and pray with you. And um, we just want you to know that the Lord is aware and that He is also the solution provider. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is to You, Holy One, Almighty, full of all knowledge that we come this morning. Nothing is hidden from you. Nothing. And we know that you are the one with the great love for us that began the plan of salvation. And we are so grateful for the willingness of God the Son, Jesus, in carrying out the plan that we can trust Him and follow Him and surrender to Him and He saves us and loves us and forgives us and gives us new life and that the Father and the Son would send us the Spirit as a wonderful gift to indwell us, to give us guidance, to regenerate us, to give us newness in us, righteousness in Jesus Christ that we can live in. But Lord, we struggle with our flesh. We struggle with our fears, with our humanity. We struggle with the fears of this world. We get caught up in wars and rumors, and we get caught up in the news. We get caught up in all sorts of things, Lord. And it's not that awareness is bad, but when it begins to affect us and we stop seeking You, and we stop making decisions prayerfully in the Spirit, then it is our flesh. And so, Lord, help us. 
Help us to be quick to confess our sin. Help us that we would learn to trust in you, that we would have great peace, contentment, and joy, and that the fruit of the Spirit would be what we are known for, not because life is perfect, but because you, the life giver, is perfect, the one we rely on and love and who saved us. Help us to live honoring you. And Lord, that we would love one another well. That we would not look down on each other. That we would instead hold one another up in prayer. That we would journey together with a deep sense of care and commitment for each other. Knowing, Lord, that together we are called to honor you with our lives as a community. And Father, continue to grow in us a passion for evangelism, that we would bring others into this relationship with you, that they too can find freedom and hope and life that only comes through the Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for all those who are talking about getting baptized. Thank you, Lord, for all those who have been professing their faith in Christ recently. And I pray, Lord, you would continue that ministry in our midst. We thank you for it. And now, Lord, help us to pray well for one another that you would be honored. In Jesus' name, amen.